There can never be enough wow in life. Our senses need input, experiences, euphoria. Our imagination needs surprises, inspirations, wonder. Welcome to Heim Textile. Whenever we see, touch and feel something, our minds and hearts start to race. Reach out for that magic moment when something new hits home. Here at Heim Textile. Here you can power up your imagination. And here you can wow your senses like never before. Let that magic happen over and over again. Here, you can unfold the magic of the newest textiles. Get in touch with great ideas, amazing people, and the most emotional moments in the textile trade. Because we all need more wow in life. Heim Textile. Welcome to WOW. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our opening press conference. It's good to see that it's getting crowded here. My name is Yvonne Seifert. I'm Director of Marketing Communication of Textiles and Textile Technology. So welcome. We finally do have a Heim Textile at the very beginning of the year, at its usual time. And so we all together kick off the fair season here in Frankfurt. Now, as you can see, we are at a very special place today. We are at our trend space. The presentation of the trend is just behind you. And as you all know, the current trends focus on circular economy. And the good thing and the really interesting thing about this space this year is it is completely sustainable. So I can really invite you have a look, join the trend tours, have a chat with Franklin Till who uh, organized everything and have a look around. Now, um, I would like to welcome Alexandra Bone. She has been with us a couple of times, so it's a well-known face. She um, gonna run you through the um, panel talk as well as the interview. Alexandra Bone is the style content director of uh, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung Quarterly, which is a spin-off of the German leading Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, the leading newspaper in Germany. So um, just a short notice, after the panel talk, uh, we're gonna have uh, the opportunity for questions from the audience as well as from the journalists who join us um, while streaming it. So um, the ones who stream it, just end uh, your questions in the chat and we're gonna try to answer them within this press conference. So we're gonna have an interesting interview and a panel talk and I'd say just send over to you, Alex. Thank Yvonne, you. thank you so much for the introduction and good morning, everyone. It feels like there's quite a buzz going on already. It's amazing. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today because it feels a bit like it's a celebratory occasion. Uh, with the pandemic for the last two years, this is the first time that Heim Textil is back in its traditional place as the first trade fair to start the season. And what's more, we're here in real life and as a physical experience, which is really great. And it's my pleasure now to welcome Detlef Braun, member of the executive board of Messe Frankfurt, to see what he has to say to this day. Talk later. Thank it's a pleasure to welcome you on the stage, Detlef. Thank you. So, good morning, Alexandra and good morning. Alex. We are committed and thank you for the lovely welcome. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's such a great pleasure, honestly. Uh, first of all, we are at the starting point of the year 2023. So I wish all of you a healthy and peaceful year 2023. I think the rest, honestly, we can solve. And the other thing you ask me how I feel or how we feel basically being back after a long absence, we are so damned happy, I can tell you, to see you personally, to see you live, to see you face to face, not in 3D, in 3D and not via any digital platforms. And honestly, the whole team is so excited and when you see all these people coming, our customers from all over the world, we're expecting customers from 120 to 130 countries to come to Heimtick Steel. This is a damned good feeling. And the feeling, I must say, was not so nice, as you can say and tell. Everybody of you is involved in the exhibition business. Just let me go briefly two or three sentences back. We had a tough time. The year, the first year of the pandemic, Messer Frankfurt, as you know, is one of the leading exhibition companies in the world. We lost about 60% of our turnover in 2020. And it was getting even worse in 2021. We lost about 80% of our business. That was tough, I can tell you. We nearly canceled 1,000 exhibitions or moved them to different appointments. But the good thing now is, I take you out of the valley, is we are back in business. Since April last year, we restarted our business. We tripled our turnover in comparison to 2021. And just to give you some numbers, we had about 310 trade shows, 52 exhibitors, and about 3.3 million visitors. This is not, of course, what we have been in 2019, but it shows that the direction is going the right way. And in 2023, Messer Frankfurt will grow again. And therefore today, it's so nice because, as you know, Heimtech Steel is the first so-called international light messer in Germany and the other ones then they will follow. And we will kick off, as you know, that Messer Frankfurt is with his expertise network, the leading organizer. We have about 60 shows around the world. And this year, this is as well a good sign not only for Frankfurt, but in general, we will launch more than 40 shows, Olaf, who is in charge of this, more than 40 textile shows along the whole value chain will be launched again in 2023. So really, we're coming back. Today, we're opening one of the most important shows, I'm Textile. We are happy to welcome about 2,400 exhibitors. And as I mentioned before, we're expecting uh, visitor nations and participants from about 120 to 130 countries around the world. Heim Textile, this is very clear, is back on track. And we have a share of over 90% of international participation. Within the portfolio of Messer Frankfurt, this is one of the really global exhibitions. And Messer Frankfurt, as you know, stands for global appear appearance. We are in 188 countries, and I would like to mention one point because it's very important. We invested, even in the pandemic situation, in our whole network. And we have some friends staying here from France, etc., where they're all coming from. We did not cancel one affiliate or sales partner. And we think this is now and brings back results as we see at Heim Textile. We will see later at Consumer Goods that we have one, between 130 to 180 nations present here back in Frankfurt because of the structure we condensed. And this, as well as you know, is a very big benefit as well for the city. There are a lot of challenging uh, around the world. There's no doubt about this. I would like to make one more point on this because it's important for the... We're talking about deglobalization. Deglobalization in or out. We, Frankfurt, believe very strongly in one international platform. And this is Heimtextil, which is going to start as today. For the next four days, I think we will discuss and see all major dynamics which are going on in this industry basically presented here at this show. 
to answer very short, I feel great and we are very relieved to be back. That was the short version, sorry. Perfect, thank you for giving <laughs> us a bit of an overview of where we're actually at. Um, now, Detlef, one of the focal points of this year's Hamtech Steel is going to be sustainability. And this is also going to be one of uh, the most decisive topics of the next couple of years. So, from your point of view, can you just tell us a little bit about how a trade fair is going to shape opportunities and how a trade fair is going to pave the way for sustainability. Absolutely. I think we have much more competent people than myself. Professor von Hattenburg is there as well and some other very valid uh, speakers who are going in depth basically when we talk about sustainability. But sustainability, I guess we all agree, it's not a mega trend. It's a paradigm shift at the moment. And I think it's not longer any option. It is really critical. It's a critical USP basically. And those who do not obey these rules and go this line, honestly, sooner or later, they will be out of the business. But sustainability is not only the main topic. We have as well a couple of other challenges at the moment. The new Supply Chain Act, etc. cetera. Uh, EU textile strategy, which is setting in place basically. And all these aspects are really turning into a big, huge call for action. And therefore, high-tech steel, there could be no better timing at the moment because under the burning glass of this trade show, you're going to see all the struggles, hopes, vision that shake and shape the international textile industry. You're going to see it here, not digitally. You're going to see it live, condensed way, personally and emotionally. Therefore, I think it's the perfect timing for Heim Textile. And one thing I would like to mention as well for the benefits, sustainability and a physical platform, the pandemic or COVID-19 has shown and has forced that very strongly the necessity of cooperation, collaboration and cooperation. And this is exactly what makes Heim Textile very valuable as a platform to make new contacts as of now for the next four days, collaboration, cooperation, who really generate business and value for business. Now, you mentioned in the beginning how Messe Frankfurt and Time Taxi in particular has managed to make a turnaround after the pandemic. Now, when we're talking sustainability, where does Messe Frankfurt stand in terms of that? Sustainability, um, and as we are not a startup company, we have 780 years on our shoulders. I'm not one of the founding members. I mentioned this already. You still hopefully can see this. We started our initiatives already in the year 2010 when we became member of the Global Compact, obeying the 10 principles, basically. In the last three years, we developed a very close cooperation with the United Nations the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which Frankfurt is a kind in the textile business ambassador, and which we're going to promote along our textile shows around the world. But this is just a piece of the puzzle. Of course, we're having a lot of initiatives as well here on the fairground, etc. by examples, uh, sourcing 100% green power, saving green water, recycling rate of 90% and a lot of other things. So step by step, basically, we are building our initiatives to become more and more sustainable with the end uh, um, objective being at latest 2050 on a net zero carbon event industry and of course platform here in Frankfurt. The latest two initiatives, just to mention of them, are the sustainability board which we introduced. We as a company introduced the so-called sustainable governance code, which provides a framework basically for all sectors of the industry of Messer Frankfurt. And the latest industry is that we're taking part in the early adapter program of the UN Global Compact, where we identify new reporting transparent system to make KPIs comparable, basically, transparent, and other things like this. But as we said, this is a, a trip we are on, step by step we're going to do this. It's not important to humble, basically, but we have to be careful that we're not getting in the area of greenwashing. As I mentioned and as I said, it's clearly one of the top priority of top management, all the sustainability ambitions at this thing. 
And of course, we're working very closely together with partnership like the United Nations. And of course, we are embracing our partners like customers, partners and shareholders on this way 2050 as I have defined it. Super, thank you so much. You know, I think it's really good. As you said, sustainability is such a complex issue and I think it's good to give some concrete numbers and initiatives that you're already doing and taking steps in the right direction and it's a process and we all need to join forces to get it done. Detlef, thank you so much for joining me this morning My on the pleasure, stage. As usual. Um, I suppose you have a bright and busy day ahead so thank you for making the time. And thank you. Good to have you Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Thank you. Enjoy and a pleasure to see all of you personally here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks Take a care. lot. Bye. Thank you. So, um, moving on, we're going to have a little panel to look deeper into the topics that we've just touched base on. Um, as you're probably guessing, um, one of the focal points of this year's Heim Textile is sustainability. And I have three fantastic panelists with me today that are going to join me here on the stage. Um, and I will introduce you to them. Of course, we're going to start with the ladies. Um, I will, it's my pleasure to start with Professor Dr. Annabel Tennes von Hartburg, who's still chatting amicably with Detlef Brown, but who I'm having join me on the stage now. Annabel, you. if you'd like to have a seat, thank you so much for joining us. Annabel is a futurologist and director of the Institute for Sustainable Management at the SRH University in Berlin. She has founded several startups in various sectors. She's an expert on sustainability, digital digitalization, and future competencies. And um, she is convinced that whole system thinking is what we need and collaborative action is also called for because that's kind of the only way that we can shape a successful economy and equal opportunity value-based society. I should also want to mention that she is one of the top LinkedIn voices when it comes to sustainability in 2022. A very warm welcome, Annabelle. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, and then I'm going to call on stage Caroline Till, who's traveled here from London. Yeah, you can give all of them a warm <laughs> hand, of course. <laughs> she is the co-founder of Futures Research Agency, Franklin Till. Um, she works with global brands and organizations, and together they explore, implement, design, material innovation for positive change. Caroline has also led the Material Futures course at renowned Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design, and she's just recently co-curated the recent exhibition Our Time on Earth at the Barbican in London, which is going to travel the world, so have a look out for that. Um, and her agency, Franklin Till, is part of the Heimtech Steel Trend Council and is this year the lead agency that's directed content and the exhibition. You'll be seeing a lot of what she's been working on in the next couple of days. And then last but not least, I'd like to welcome Olaf Schmidt, who's joining us today as well. He's the Vice President Textiles and Textiles Technology at Messe Frankfurt. And he's in the know with every minute detail of Heim Textile and Messe Frankfurt. So I'm going to stray from protocol and start with a gentleman in terms of questions. Um, Olaf, let's jump right into it. I think sustainability really is on everyone's agenda today, obviously. And we are seeing a lot of regulatory action and a rise of consumer awareness at the moment. Um, then again, sustainability might be on everyone's mind. At the same time, it's not the most tangible topic. It's rather quite complex. From your point of view, how do trade fairs and home textile in particular foster a better understanding of the topic? Yeah, first of all, um, I'm really happy uh, to see all of you, you know, two times, no Heim Textile in January. Uh, we had a very successful uh, smaller edition, the summer edition, together with Tech Textile and Tech uh, last June. But now to the traditional day in January, so I'm very happy to offer this to uh, the whole industry for home and contract textiles. And as you said, okay, to looking um, at sustainability, I think it's important to do it from different perspective. 
because it's, as we know, really complex. And um, sustainability um, is uh, part um, of the industry thinking, business thinking, but also of action. There are a lot of regulation which are relevant for the industry um, and uh, on, not only for huge companies, also for small and medium-sized companies. There are a lot of international regulation. Um, for example, as mentioned by Detlef Brown, the Supply Chain Act, but also um, reporting standard uh, being developed by uh, or being developed on EU level. And for, um, for Germany, we have the situation um, that already some of this regulation come into force for the companies uh, and um, companies take care on this issue. But nevertheless, we also see from the consumer side, uh, from, um, from the retailer side, for example, um, sustainability is really important and there is a high demand exactly to know something about the DNA of the product because the textile industry is really global. And um, I think um, there is a really interesting study uh, from the consultant firm Simon uh, Kuscher uh, from the last year. So very actual, it's, it's an interesting um, report about a global the global sustainability study. And the idea was to have a survey with around uh, 12,000 end consumer, global end consumers. Uh, and the result, I would say, is really optimistic. Uh, the result is that 75% of this end consumer find um, sustainability as or even more important than in the year 2021. And the textile industry, as global industry, is in the middle of this development. So from the consumer side, from the relation side, there is a pressure to the industry also to uh, change something and um, yeah, to, um, to implement um, also uh, sustainable uh, production processes and uh, to, to get a, a sustainable DNA in the future. So I would say Heim Textile as a global platform with 2,400 companies here in Frankfurt is exactly the right place to have an exchange of ideas, to, to see something, what's happened in, in the textile industry, like the transformation in the textile industry. So we offer the platform for the industry. And after a long time not to meet each other, it's now the chance to do it here for four days from um, the buyer side, like retailer, wholesaler, but also industry side together with the producer side. And uh, we as Messe Frankfurt, we as Heim Textile, our target is to have a lot of formats uh, to have like a knowledge transfer about sustainability. But nevertheless, we see a transformation of many companies also here at the show. I would like to give you some examples. Uh, we have companies uh, which produce or uh, offer um, fibers from pet bottles. And these are uh, blended with natural fibers like hemp or bed linen of cotton uh, coated with uh, cork. But also uh, uh, in the wonderful material library, we see an um, offer of um, a company which use seagrass uh, for acoustic mats and also some uh, dyeing material like with mushrooms. So that's on the production side or on the material side, but also on the production side, there is, of course, um, the tendency of many companies to have uh, photovoltaic systems, uh, the buzzword is um, industry 4.0 and smart uh, production with uh, track record and uh, the possibility to see exactly what's happened with the textile from the fiber to the rainy made product. So many possibilities and at the end I would like to mention that we as Messe Frank would have a lot of formats exactly to give this knowledge transfer but I'm sure we can talk about this later on. Yeah, let's come back to that later. I think what we're all gathering is how complex an issue sustainability really is. There's such a wealth of info that's going to be available to you guys here in terms of material innovation and what companies are doing. Speaking about complexity and the company side, Annabelle, maybe we can touch base on something because I know you're well acquainted with corporate culture, with systemic thinking, with future leadership. Um, from your point of view, why would you say an analog platform like a trade fair is so important when it comes to the topic of sustainability? 
Thank you for this question. Um, the course I have to see personally, when I, when I came here this morning, I was more than happy to see the crowd of people standing in front of the fair and houses and having the feeling, okay, we are back here. We are back and um, coming together, seeing each other personally, um, ex talking with each other. It's such a difference to do this virtually and to, the, to do this in person. I think no, none of you would disagree with me. Um, and for me, I'm really a lover of, of fairs like this, especially branch fairs, because there's nothing more than being together personally to share storytelling experiences, meet, as it's a completely different quality. And I know um, if we take the pen um, and, and count um, how many flight kilometers, how many carbon and 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 we used to come in here from all from the people here, from all visitors and and exhibitors and so on. Okay, yes, there will be a high amount of money, of energy, and so so on we waste. But what do we get back? when we are getting back from this fair after a few days or after a few moments of experience. I, mean, I just mentioned your area of creativity and um, um, we have the cover, we have in cover, uh, we have in cover that we, I studied also at Central St. Martins and I know how important it is to feel fabric, to, to, to see it with all senses and it's the same with meeting people. If you want to get in closer touch with people, you need that. And therefore I'm so more than happy to be here seeing that so many people are here and understanding how important that is. And um, yes, sustainability um, is also something we're counting and measuring is super important. But one of the KPIs of sustainability is the S of the S ESG. And the S stands for social. And it's all about um, intercultural competences, diversity. It's all about um, yeah, being together, sharing of experiences and creating something more which is more that digital and if we're talking about a change of KPIs when we're talking about sustainability and what can be more than being here at the Heim Textile understanding that we need back our five senses to understand that we have to change the world therefore Heim Textile is I think gives this approach of what we need mostly to live sustainability we need to feel and smell and see what we need to use our senses and therefore Heim Textile is for me the best approach of sustainability to um, understand what exactly um, means sustainability and sustainable living. Super, thank you so much. Um, I think, Olaf, when I come back to you, um, you've already given us some examples of material innovation that we're going to see. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about um, different measures that exhibitors are taking already to be more energy efficient, to use less water, to maybe work with circular technologies? Yes, of course, uh, as we know, the textile industry is a textile and fashion industry is a very global industry and uh, well connected. Um, and we see also, especially um, in Asia, there was a um, transition of the production um, methods. Um, so, um, which kind of dyeing um, technology, technology you use, how is the process of the production? It's really important. And as you know, we have not only hand textile in our portfolio, also um, machinery exhibition and tech textile. And exactly these kinds of innovations are important uh, to create a very sustainable and holistic product. I think that's very important. The, the, the thinking is uh, not only to focusing on one part of sustainability. No, you have to be really holistic. And this is also a result when we look, for example, to the Green Directory, that's a catalogue uh, of Heim Textile, uh, where you find um, companies uh, at the show which offering sustainable solutions. It's increasing. We have a high application numbers of uh, companies who are part of this Green Directory. And I'm also a little proud because I can say since uh, 2010, we already implement sustainable issues and topics at Heim Textile. At the beginning, it was really new and a lot of companies didn't uh, feel comfortable to go in this direction. But now, also, when we look here at this show, we have so many companies and this is uh, the new, I say the normality of, of the textile industry already. 
and the technology is really important to be sustainable and this is also the result when you go when you have time to see this wonderful products from our exhibitors here at the show when you said holistic i think that's quite a cue for you because holistic for me also relates to the concept of circularity and it feels like that has been such a buzzword but can you just let us in a little bit on why that is so important yeah i, I think we're living in unprecedented times obviously in, in our awareness of the impact that humans have now had on the planet um, and it's interesting within sustainable <laughs> agenda actually the word sustainability is problematic in itself if you think about the definition of sustainable it means to maintain the status quo but we've actually reached the point that we can't maintain as we are operating now we need to do things differently so you know hence we start to you might have heard of the word regenerative we're actually starting to need to think about you know processes materials how we can actually put back better rather than just doing things and you know business as normal circularity i guess is, is an approach that aims to do zero damage that if we keep things in you know if we're talking about textiles we're talking about products things that we surround ourselves with if we can design and make them if we can extract materials uh, transform them and then keep them in a closed loop as in extend their life ideally infinitely to be able to put back into production so that no value is lost you know then then that's that's the ultimate that then there is you know we're not having that detrimental impact on the planet so really circularity for, we we're often working with huge global brands and we find that lots of even the design teams they don't actually know what it means they're kind of disillusioned they're confused by you know this complex ideas and especially system thinking it's 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 hard so we often talk about designing the end at the beginning and for me that's the essence of what circularity is about if if you know if we're extracting materials and transforming them we need to then at the very beginning of that process think about where is it going at its end of life? Um, we're now using 1.75 planets worth, nearly two planets worth of resources. And in the next decade, that is expected to dramatically increase. In the US alone, for example, uh, last year was produced 11.3 million tonnes of textile waste. So I think it's quite clear that we can't carry on doing just as we are. So if we can extend life or if we can use material innovation to keep something in a closed loop system to be infinitely made and remade, then, you know, that's that's the ultimate aim. I think it's so important that you're actually going to be providing info on what is circularity, how can I start and implement that within my own company, what kind of examples can I look to, to you know, model what I'm doing to their business. Um, and I think what you're also doing with the trend space, and we're going to come to back to that later on, is that you're actually going to have us experience... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm causing... <laughs> causing noise let me should i take it off okay fine sorry <laughs> <laughs> all good now i think um is that in the trend space you're um going to make the idea of sustainability something that's experienceable and not just an abstract concept that left brown in his opening speech said something about trade fairs being a business model with an impact so i'm going to come back to olaf because i know that's something that you guys find quite uh, important and that's that we don't just stick with abstract concepts that but that we offer experiences and an understanding of textile sustainability and discovery. Can you just elaborate a little on what that actually means in at Time Textile? Yes, um, it's a pleasure, Alex. First, I would say uh, we as uh, Messe Frankfurt, we as Time Textile, can't make the textile industry and fashion industry more sustainable. But with our formats, with global hubs, we give the opportunity to bring the industry together. Uh, to, to, to like like a knowledge transfer so we have a variety of formats here at Hand Textile this year I would like to mention uh, some of the formats already I mentioned the green directory so the list of uh, companies which offering sustainable solution we have green lectures uh, with international experts about circle economy green washing 
really is, I think it's also a very important issue about also new technologies. Uh, we have a green village, it's a dedicated area um, in Hall 110, uh, which um, certifiers, because you know certifiers are really important to guarantee the origin of a product, uh, to take care on social and environmental standards. And in this area, the first time, we have also companies uh, which dedicated themselves for a holistic, sustainable product. Um, this will be also part of the village. And we have green tours. I really recommend to be part of the green tours. This is uh, guided by an independent uh, consultant, Bernd Müller, and he offer the possibility to, to go with you and to go with visitors to companies and to talk exactly what is the vision of your strategy, what is, do you have already the whole collection sustainable on your capsule collection, so a very uh, interaction of, of ideas and uh, I think it's also a knowledge transfer. So I think this is our chance also to, to offer this as Heimtech deal and um, this presentation here in Hall 90, uh, the trend area is the most sustainable pro uh, um, presentation which we ever had from the design, the construction of um, the presentation, but also from the products. So circular economy, uh, economy is, is the buzzword for that and the headline for this, but we have a lot of formats exactly to, to inform about um, sustainable transformation in the textile industry. Um, and I think uh, you can learn a lot together with our customers here in Frankfurt. Yeah, I think maybe when you walked here for the press conference, uh, you walked by the trend space and the textiles matter and it's really, it feels like everyone is flocking there because it looks so enticing. And I know that we're friendly until you've set up the concept for that, you've set up everything. Can you maybe just let us know a little bit of what to expect at the textiles matter trend space? Sure, so I guess we believe in approaching the topic of sustainability, not from looking at what can we restrict and how can we, you know, not from a negative perspective, but trying to show um, the innovation that's possible. And so for, within Textiles Matter, we're saying we can make huge impact within the textile industry. Um, and what we've tried to do is really, as I said, get to the kind of the nitty gritty of what circularity means. We basically are trying to explain that if we think of materials in systems, they're not static, you know, they're in dynamic systems. And we've got these four themes that are each presenting two sides of circularity. If we, we can talk about the biological cycle, which basically means material that are biologically derived of nature. If we think of natural materials that's in the biological system. The great thing about biological system is those materials can naturally degrade. So if we can lead them back into to natural process of de degradation, or we have the technical cycle, which is human made materials. And again, we can manipulate those to keep them to, to prolong life or keep them in those closed loop systems. And we wanted to present both sides of that story because it's really important we have to oversimplify things and people want to say, oh, natural is good and, you know, synthetic is bad and plastics are bad, for example. But that isn't the case. That's not as long as we're dealing responsibly with those systems. So we have basically two themes which are exploring the, um, the biological cycle, which are exploring the celebrating uh, materials of nature. Um, so we're exploring um, innovations in natural dye, um, as um, uh, Mr. Schmidt already mentioned, looking at innovations such as mushroom dyeing or, or reviving perhaps historical processes. And um, we're looking at nature engineering, so looking at um, exploration of innovation in biomaterial. So we have an amazing designer in the space workshopping who has got many years of working with new biomaterials and he's here demonstrating and, and so please do have a chat with him. And then exploring the technical cycle, we've got the theme continuous, which is looking at closed loop synthetic material innovation. We have a company called Smile Plastics who have an amazing system set up to keep their synthetic plastic materials in complete closed loop systems. Again, they're going to be demonstrating. They've got lots of samples to show. And then we have um, the final theme, which is make and remake, which is again about reusing human made material, but using processes of applying color and power 
pattern um, to, to rejuvenate. And we've got um, a team from the Centre for Circular Design from the University of Arts London that have got various different revival techniques that they want to share with you. So hopefully the whole thing is supposed to be like a, a, an exciting materials library that shows you examples, you know, real-time examples of this innovation in practice that you can, you know, engage with and hopefully glean lots of inspiration from. I think it sounds absolutely fantastic and I'm going to make sure that I stop by later on and try and experience it myself, so thank you. Um, as we can all see, there is a wealth of info on that topic already, on the idea of material, material innovation and so on and so on. I'm going to shift back to your focus of expertise and that's um, work, future of work, uh, future processes. Um, now when we're talking about implementing sustainability in a company, I know that you really stress that um, communication is important to create efficient processes. Can you just briefly touch on what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, um, when we talk about a stakeholder, then we often talk first just about the customer. Um, but we don't see the internal customer, which is also, of course, an employee working in a company who should not only um, be a kind of customer, but also an influencer, feel as a kind of ambassador for the company who she works for. This is a completely different approach for some companies thinking about an employee just giving money for um, and for getting some some results of work or some giving some task and it's, it's from this old term thinking of bottom up top down um, but um, when we want to live sustainability. Um, what, if we want to love sustainability in a sustainable way, then we have to um, drive this in a completely different approach, which means that we are not talking anymore about a bottom-up, top-down. We are talking more about metrics, organizations, of course, but it's even more we are talking about holistic organizations, where we are meeting at the eye level with everybody and where each of the people has an idea of what's going on here and I can play an important role here in, in, my, in my area and where we are not talking about just the task given but talking about the responsibilities for, yeah, for the company playing a role in this, um, yeah, doing something for, yeah, giving the world a future for us as humans. And um, putting this into the microcosm, um, there were some companies during the time of Corona saying, okay, um, now we don't have our employees anymore here in the office. We don't have the control of checking what's up with them. And I, I spoke with some board members of companies saying, oh, that's really bad for me. Of course, I have no idea where it's taking and what he's doing here under this part. So maybe he's doing something like this year, so I'm really aggressive being here in this call. Or maybe he's doing something with the legs I don't see, which shows, gives me, could give me signals, see him hanging in person, by knowing that he's not willing to work here anymore or is unsatisfied or whatever. But um, it, was a, it was an idea of a lot of companies bringing the employees back into office to see more what's going on. And I think bringing them back to office has other chances, has other chances of a little more collaborative approach if you define company as a, yeah, as a kind of organic, uh, holistic ele elements working and in in bringing together um, each of them their potential. And then we see this as a kind of um, organic um, development. Um, but that means, of course, completely different KPIs, as I said. And um, it's not meaning uh, department by department thinking. It's an outside the box thinking, which is not that easy. But communication Communication is the key, and it all starts with each of the employees. It starts with surveys where they are asked. It starts with the results which are taken into account of the board level. It starts with having, for example, um, strategic groups which are bringing together an, a worker, a production worker, together with a CEO and one table where they're discussing topics, and these topics are not just 
um, written down they used for the strategy of the company. We are at the point where this is super important that we take every th everybody with us and not just um, with everything around the company but also with the idea of sustainability. I've, I know so many companies which are embedded for example for the education and many great talent and career programs but what is missing is information about sustainability. So there are a lot of people in finance, in HR, in marketing, in sales, which have no idea what sustainable is. And I often get the question, why are you in sustainability? I can't hear this word anymore. I think this is really a, a bad buzzword, isn't it? I said, no, of course not. It stands for such a great approach of bringing a company to the next level, to a future level, bring our world to the level where we yeah, still want to live in. And, um, and therefore, it starts with every small each unit and this is every and each employee and there are some companies where, which are doing great in this just as Patagonia for example where for example social media is not, a, is not just marketing it's a kind of a sense of the company culture and where company culture is not a just the hey we need to have this um, but where it's lift and um, it's more than that it's a kind of heart of a company and if you do that then it can be also a great a play a great part into marketing yes but then it's much more than just a greenwashing or just a um, idea of doing this or that to sell better and this is understood more and more also by the consumer which are more and more looking precisely not just into that it's not a cradle to cradle um, um, instead of cradle to grave but um, that all the consumers that all the, not consumers, but employees are living that and are heard and embedded. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it comes down to that we really need to have everyone on board, whether that's on the employee side, whether that's on the consumer side, within a company, all of that. Um, Olaf, that also brings me to the to the idea of partnerships. And Detlef Braun earlier on mentioned the one with the UN Global Compact. Um, from your side, are there any other partnerships that we should be aware of? I think you need strong partners, international partners, uh, to change something in a sustainable manner. And um, we as Messe Frankfurt, um, with our textile activities, I think it was also mentioned by Detlef, we have a very strong and variable partnership with United Nations Office for Partnership and the Conscious Fashion and Lifestyle Network in New York City since 2019. And the idea was um, yeah, to, to inform and give knowledge about just, um, the SDGs of the UN, the 17 SDGs. So we spotlight these SDGs on our shows worldwide. We have more than 50 textile shows. Uh, we have the completely value chain from yarn, fabrics, home textile, apparel fabrics, technical textile, the machinery part to fashion. And uh, so I think it's, it's interesting exactly to use these platforms also for United Nations Office for Partnership to spotlight the SDGs. So this cooperation is um, uh, very strong and um, we have uh, at our shows uh, lectures, uh, we have uh, also a special presentation, some uh, libraries, uh, sustainable libraries. And our plan is also to go forward with this cooperation in the future. Because only when we have strong partnership, it's uh, possible to transport the information about the transformation uh, in the textile and fashion industry. I think at this point, I feel like we've given quite an overview over what you can expect in the next couple of days here. So maybe we can open this up to questions from you guys. And someone's going to come to you if you just raise your hand. <laughs> and then we can start and answer your questions. Uh, at the outset, let me appreciate that, you know, the Western world is thinking of the Mother Earth. And uh, you all are, you know, working on sustainability, circularity, industry 4.0. However, let me point out that the entire supply chain is in the developed world. And how do you propose to lift the developed nation, I mean, the underdeveloped and the developing nations to reach your level? I think that's a really good question. Who of you guys would want to go ahead and answer that? Annabelle. Annabelle, would you like to jump in there? 
Okay. Um, I couldn't hear this very well. Is it possible that he, um, well, from, uh, I am? I can try and try and see if I sorry. understood you correctly. If, if I'm not mistaken, what you ask is that the complexity of the supply chain and to measure up to sustainability standards is quite something in the first world, but it's even more challenging in second and third world countries. Is that about yeah, Exactly. It? Okay. Because your entire imports are coming from the developed nations, from the Asian region. Whereas you are sitting in the West and talking about sustainability, circularity, these are the buzzwords, but yeah. the supply chain in the countries Nobody is thinking on those lines. So how do you propose to, you know, ask them to imbibe these ethos which you are talking about? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a very important question and um, I think it was also a question um, created a lot of discussion at the COP27 um, a while ago where um, yeah, we we are facing a world which is not a one world, um, let's say, and where of course um, there are countries who are more attached to us by the consequences of the climate crisis until now already than others. And we have on the one hand, of course, the companies, the industry companies, which um, wasted a lot of energy in the past, which developed a lot in the past. And we have on the other hand, the developing countries, which were often used to put their the garbage, to put the, the waste, um, and of, of course where we see a lot of this climate crisis, right? And on the one hand, uh, these developing countries want to be leveled up, which is clear, and um, they want to be seen also that, um, yeah, there's, they need some support, of course, because if we see some of the areas there, it's, it's unbelievable, it's so horrible to seeing that it looks like a, yeah, it looks like a um, like an empty planet, a dark empty planet, some areas there, and, it's, um, and there are areas which you can't clean normally anymore, and where you can't, um, which you can't replant anymore. And therefore, of course, um, for these countries, questions about 1.5 degrees, for example, or decarbonization or so, these sounds like really interesting countries and luxury, luxury questions. And it's a it's a responsibility of the industry countries to um, support, of course, these countries in a way that they first give money for um, renaturing um, these areas which are destroyed, for finding solutions, secondly, to, yeah, to not bringing the waste, the garbage to these countries, um, which shows us that, I mean, if we have these, if it states in our country, we don't want to have that, then we have to find solutions of working in a cleaner way, working with less, and uh, using less water, for example, working uh, in a way that we have other, other ways of production in the end, if also if everything what's produced, even the, the bad things, stays in our country, because this brings us to reflect and to need to the need to find solutions. If we can't say, okay, we bring this 8,000 kilometers away, nobody's interested anymore, right? And then we need to teach them. Because we can't, we, we can't think that everyone and every nation is that far that they know which technologies are important or are good. We, we need to teach them and finding solutions with the solutions we already have. And fourth, and that shows how important high textile is, we need global solutions. I mean, we here in Germany, we are often in a small thinking in the box uh, where we think that if we change the world here in Germany, it, makes a, it creates a big difference in the world. Of course, it's important to be a role model. No? I don't say anything against it, but it's not it's not enough anymore. And if we know the Book of Meadows, written 50 years ago, and I attended um, the, the anniversary and um, the Jubilee um, meeting at the, at the Club of Rome, I mean, for me, it was more that I had to cry than to clap the hands and say, great, 50 years after Meadows, um, and after Meadows' book, which shows 50 years ago that we have to change something and which said 50 years ago that we have to think global and act global much more and not just that the industry comp uh, countries produce in the developing countries to save some money, not just to bring the garbage and the waste back into the de developing countries to give them money via that because this is unfair. 
it shows that we need a global approach which is the base of a holistic thinking, which is a completely different, different thing and where all the partners which are embedded place the same role, have the same, uh, have the same rights in addition. And this brings us so, to so many questions, and I, um, I don't think that, a, that something like a COP27 can change us. I mean, it's a 27, and that speaks for everything, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I think your questions um, brings it to the really rural point. It's yeah, a pain think, point for many. I but think so too. I think as you can see by the wealth of answers that we're getting here is that it's really an important topic. I hope it to some extent answers your question. And moving on, are there any other questions? <laughs> I think there is one over there. I don't see it, I'm sorry. Muss vorne sein. Uh, my question is, uh, sustainability has a cost, especially for the, uh, just like my colleague uh, highlighted that, uh, the countries like Pakistan is facing the uh, uh, bad uh, challenges of the climate change and they lost the 30 billion dollars in their economy. Mm -hmm. how, how the countries like Pakistan can invest in their industry or the governments uh, to make the industry, textile industry sustainable? Huh? Mm -hmm. So my question is, is there any plan of the, or the roadmap, the big... Uh, Can you speak a bit louder, please? Sorry, maybe it's just me, but I don't get it. Uh, as I highlighted, uh, <laughs> sustainability has a cost, mm -hmm. especially for the countries like Pakistan, mm -hmm. which is uh, facing the uh, uh, impacts of the climate change. We have lost the $30 billion, $30 billion infrastructures and agriculture and everything. Mm. So, is there any roadmap or the plan uh, the big buyers countries have mm. uh, to support these countries? They are facing mm. climate change issues. Mm. Support invest their industries to make their products and their supply chain sustainable. Mm. Caroline, is there something that you would like to? Answer I guess. To? I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to answer it very specifically, but both. both Do you still questions. have your microphone? Sorry. Is it, should I take that out? I think we need to, and I'm not saying I know, know exactly how to get here, but we need to more deeply acknowledge that we are existing in a completely interconnected, globalised world. And this might not be a popular answer, but I think the brands that are producing and distributing product at scale need to take more responsibility for supporting more holistically suppliers that they're working with. I think we are seeing the massive scale, you know, devastating impact of, of climate emergency impacts, you know, very specific areas of the planet. And I think we're, we're, we're needing to operate in a way that we are more, we've kind of lost our sense of value effectively we're not we're not placing enough value on the extraction and uh, transformation of material and therefore we're selling things very very cheaply and it's at everybody's cost ultimately so i think that's one thing we need to look at is actually what is the true cost of of things but also how can you know how can we support, and that needs to happen on a global system level, and that's a political question which I can't answer, you know, countries that have already experienced huge loss through, to, through climate, you know, through the floods that we've seen, we need to come together as a global stage and, and support that. But I think in terms of an industry level, I really think suppliers that have been working with, you know, industries that have been particularly hit or wiped out, they need to maintain that level of responsibility. At the moment, there you can work with somebody and then you can pull out and go and work with somebody completely different with no, and I just don't think we can work like that anymore. I think we need to acknowledge a responsibility with our relationships and, and have that as a, as a deeper um, and, and more meaningful relationship that actually follows through rather than being able to extract and go elsewhere, leaving people with nothing and, you know, devastating. So I'm sorry, it's not a very um, succinct answer, but I'm 
extremely sympathetic to you know suppliers that have had their whole livelihoods worked out wiped out and i just think we need to actually come together as a global industry to to, to take responsibility sorry that's not a very <laughs> uh, no i think sort of it's quite helpful. answer yeah do you guys want to add anything to that are you good there's another question right there Hi, I'm Jennifer Castoldi from Trendies International. Uh, it's a bit of a micro question. We're talking about macro sustainability, circularity, and regenerative design. But we're here at a trade show. I go to a lot of trade shows every year. Maybe uh, Olaf or Caroline can ask, what happens to the carpet? H have to what? The carpet. At the end of the day, there's so much carpet in trade shows. Mm. What, what happens to it at the end of the, the few days? I, I can answer that just from the experience that we've had, if that's okay, because it was one of the biggest questions we had. It, it hurt. I mean, I, I think it is important after this conversation to go back through the trade fair and look at it new, with new eyes in terms of the amount that we're creating and, um, and obviously the, the miles of carpet that are being used. It was one of the first questions we had, um, and it, it is all recycled. It's, it's exhibition cord. So it is made of recycled content. It's not as what we wanted it to be was closed loop circular. And there is, I, I won't name check them, but there is, a, there is a carpet manufacturer that we're exhibiting in the, which is completely closed loop circular, as in it's made of, um, it's made of backing and pile, which is, they have a, a system in which they take it back. And I think this is what we're talking about in material uh, sustainability. It's about being the custodian. Often you're making something, you sell it to somebody and suddenly it's no longer your responsibility. What the carpet that we're showing has the manufacturer then, to, even after it's laid, it still maintains responsibility for the whole of its life. So it will take it back and it can be completely deconstructed and 100% is remade into new carpet. And that's ideally, that's what we wanted to go for. We couldn't use that carpet, unfortunately, because of regulations, because of fire regulation. So we do have a systemic structure that also needs to be looked at in terms of health and safety we're, we're we're pinning ourselves into such a corner so that's another problem but i do know that this this carpet that heim textile uses and i guess messer frankfurt uses is a high high percentage of recycled content but what we really need to aim for is completely 100 percent closed loop made back into new carpet um, as you guys can probably see, I've been checking my watch because we've been going on for quite a while, which is great. I think we can answer one last question if there is one very pressing one. And there is one right over there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, have, uh, I am in uh, MD Yunis, uh, Kotlok Acting, Asian in Germany, the Netherlands. My uh, question, and I simply one question, and I would like to get three answers. How we can create demand for such great concept like sustainability, like circular economy in this uh, industry? Uh, I believe, if you allow to me, and it is not my answer, uh, a lot of uh, companies, manufacturers in this industry will not go to this direction because it is good for environment, it is good for uh, uh, planet sack. I, I believe we should uh, somehow create demand, not just because you should do it or you should you should you should you should do them. You should not do it. How we can create demand for such great concepts? Thank you. I understand. Huh? Oh, how? I didn't. Get Did you say how do we create demand? Demand for sustainability. Demand. Oh, here we go. Demand for sustainability. Do now I got in, you. Do you mean? Do you, do you mean as in demand yeah. from customers? No. No. How we can make sustainability uh, like a product? All of us would like to gain it. Would like to obtain it. How we can create demand for sustainability? As in, okay, I mean, I would say very simply, demand is there. There is, if you look at statistics in relation to people wanting to purchase products that are, for example, made of recycled content. If you, five years ago, the major brands that we work with, I'm talking about Samsung, Adidas, 
we had to convince them to say, you need to use your own waste, tell the story, you know, label it, and they said, no, it's not aspirational. Now, they're all completely understanding that if it's not made of recycled content, if it doesn't have a, 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 an added, you know, a sustainability story to it, people are asking, why not? So I think the question from my perspective is not how do we make the demand, the demand is there. The question is how do we tell the stories meaningfully, truthfully, how do customers separate the, the non-truths, you know, the, the greenwashing, the purpose washing, you know, the brands that are not doing the good work but are jumping on the bandwagon with careful marketing strategies as opposed to actual sustainable innovation. How do we make sure that um, you know, it is, it's actually really sustainable as, a, as opposed to a marketing ploy? F from, from our perspective, the demand is way exceeds the capability of these brands to keep up. And, uh, oh. <laughs> One second. second. <laughs> okay. See, there are always two teams working in a retailer or a brand. The first team is always harping on what systems need to be followed, whether circularity, sustainability. And they prevail upon the seller, that is the Asian countries, you know, to follow those systems. And the second team is the sourcing team of the same organization goes and when they tell them we are following what your department has told us mm. now you got to pay us a higher price mm. the sourcing team never agrees to pay a single cent yeah so I how do you propose that this is ever going to be implemented you know i think that what we're seeing is that there is room for quite a lively conversation which is great and i think that we might want to continue that in one-on-one -on -one sessions after this press conference i think everyone for joining us this morning on the stage here i think everyone for joining us in the audience i hope that all of you have bright days ahead here at time text here and thanks very much for joining us today yeah Thank you, Alex. Thank you for all our, to all our speakers and Detlef Brown as well. And thank you for joining us as well on the great interest on the topic. And as Alex just said, we should keep discussing it because I get the feeling there are loads and loads of questions that are still need to be answered. And maybe we do not have answers yet, but hopefully later on. So I will invite you to keep on discussing. Um, join us, join the trend tours that are just directly afterwards that are led by Caroline. And just use the fair to discuss and find solution hopefully all together. Now at the back you see all the highlights you're gonna have today and all the other highlights for the follow-up dates um, you're gonna find in the press center. For the one who want to join the trend tours with Caroline that are directly afterwards just please exchange your headset because you're gonna need a new one. All our speakers and guests are available for interviews afterwards, so please, please feel free to come up to us and um, discuss, ask questions, everything that's um, important for you. I would like also to thank the Technic team, it's always fun working with you. And I would also like to use the opportunity to thank my team. Um, they've done an amazing job in the past months. Um, thank you very much and um, well my team and I we are here for you so um, if you have any questions if you need any further information please do not hesitate to contact us and I do hope we see you around at our daily happy hour I'm gonna have a drink or two and keep discussing thank you very much thank you very much